Concerning, uh, concerning the practice of fellowship. What are the things which hinder the matter of fellowship? And now for three Sundays, two or three Sundays, we've been discussing the first problem that's involved with reference to fellowship, and that's the problem of sin. Sin is the very first thing that he deals with, which indicates that this is a problem that breaks fellowship with a believer and his Lord in the pilgrim journey. <clears throat> and we've noticed in verse 8 that one of the first things he speaks of concerning the calamity, and that is for an individual to say, well, when I have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, I am perfectly sinless. My condition is that, which is, now I am perfectly sinless. Well, the Bible simply tells us that the one who believes this, if we should say that we do not have sin, the very first thing we do, we deceive ourselves. We lead ourselves astray. And the Bible further says the truth is not in us. And so regardless of what our profession is, God says the reality of it is that you're absolutely deceived and the truth is not in you. Then he deals with a cure for the matter of sin and the life of the believer, and that is found in verse 9, which we dealt with last Sunday. And the wonderful cure for this problem of sin in light of the pilgrim journey is confession. <clears throat> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And isn't this wonderful? This indicates then to us that as we walk in the pilgrim journey and we become contaminated by virtue of some act of sin that we have done, we become aware that there's something that's not right between our heart and the Lord. And he says, if we will confess that to Him. Now you'll please notice, it does not mean to confess it to some preacher. It does not mean to confess it to some teacher. The confession is made to Him, our Father, if we confess our sins. And confession is <clears throat> saying the same thing or agreeing to that act that you have committed and stating it to Him. It isn't the end of the day as we come along, now God forgive me for all of my sins today. That's sort of passing the buck off onto Him. The idea is that when you and I get involved in a problem that breaks fellowship with Him <clears throat> in our pilgrim journey, we are to make that thing known to Him <clears throat> and express in our heart that we have done this and He has promised them to forgive it and also to cleanse us. That's the wonderful cure. And I claim First John 1, 9 as the believers John 3.16, because what John 3.16 means to the unsaved, 1 John 1.9 means to the believer. Now then, he takes up another problem following this matter of an act of sin. And this is probably what you're going to run up against uh, from a practical point of view more than possibly verse 8. And notice what verse 10 says. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now then, this speaks of the profession of the conduct that we have arrived by virtue of our walk in a manner that we do not sin. Now, how we wish that could be the case, isn't that right? But <clears throat> the Bible clearly tells us something. And he's speaking about believers now. You and me, we who have trusted Jesus as our Savior. If we believe that in our conduct, in our walk, in our pilgrim practice, that we have arrived at a place where we do not sin, what does the Bible say? We make him a liar and his word is not in us. There are two statements that are extremely strong. 
we might look at them and say they're quite harsh. Now this is God's word, it isn't mine. If we believe and we profess that we have arrived by virtue of our pilgrim journey to a plane of a walk that we never sin in action, either thought, word, or deed, and we say that we have arrived at that place, Oh, listen, how harsh, but how true. Do you know what we're doing to God? We're just simply telling God He doesn't know what He's talking about. That we have immediately aligned ourselves with what the Lord Jesus Christ accused a group of people in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. Ye are of your father the devil, for he was a liar from the beginning and a father of lies. And we try to make them. This is, this is, you stop to think about it. For a Christian to say this, we're telling God he's just like Satan. You know that? We make him a liar. Him a liar. Unfortunately, <clears throat> there is quite, quite, quite a large segment of people today that feel as though they can arrive in the pilgrim journey, in this earthly walk, to a conduct whereby they're totally free from sin. Now they profess that and they believe that. But ah, when you take that particular thought and put it on the spotlight of the Word of God, the Bible says for such a person, for such a person, he makes him a liar. God a liar. And uh, I, uh, I really did not uh, let the magnitude of this truth strike me until uh, just uh, studying for this little series of studies with you. How many times I preached on it, I don't know. But now, you know, if I ever run up against a person that to my face says that to me, I'm going to use First John chapter 1. I have to. I said, oh, listen, you may be a brother in Christ or a sister, but oh, how wrong you are from the standpoint of the word. And do you really know, do you really realize what you're doing to God? Do you? You're making Him a liar. You're putting God in the same camp as Satan. And that's just exactly what Satan wants you to do. Folks, According to verse 8, our condition is not sinless. And according to verse 10, our conduct is not sinless either. But, oh, listen, even though we're not sinless, isn't it wonderful to be forgiven? I always stand, and, and I have to stand, and you have to stand, and everyone has to stand constantly before God <clears throat> as guilty, but pardoned. Isn't that wonderful? 
the jury has come in. And I'm in the dock. And the man in charge of the court says, Will the prisoners please stand? And I have to stand. Have you reached your verdict? Yes, we have, sir. Would you please tell us what your verdict is? Yes, Al Clock, we find guilty as charged. He stands guilty before God. He has sinned. He has sinned. And I don't care how much I've tried to persuade the court. I don't care how much I've tried to persuade myself. I don't care how much I've tried to persuade the people my friends, my sphere of emphasis, and I can just holler, hoot, and yell, and be as emphatic and dogmatic as possible. Nothing wrong with me. I'm right. I'm sinless. The jury, you're guilty. And I stand condemned, absolutely as charged, before the court, my Father, Heavenly Father. But then, Father, there's only one thing I can plead, and that is... <clears throat> the blood of Jesus Christ. I am guilty. I have sinned. The jury is right. All I've been doing is I've been trying to persuade people in my way of thinking that possibly I could persuade you. But you know you look upon the heart. You look upon the very thoughts and the intents of my being. You know I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And because of that, I can only plead the blood of another. Jesus Christ, your Son, who died on the cross. And as he acknowledges the fact of the court, he'll turn to me. <laughs> said, Al Clock, you are guilty. But because you have availed yourself of that which I have provided, I now pronounce you totally pardoned. Totally pardoned. It isn't that you're not guilty. You are. But you're forgiven. Forgiven. Now hold your head up. Square your shoulders and walk this pilgrim journey with me. Don't ever, don't ever fall to the trap again of putting me with Satan. Don't make me, don't make me Satan. Don't make me a liar. You know, 
I don't know how people can do it. And I'll guarantee you, precious people, <clears throat> if you'll stand with your Lord and you'll stand square with Him, all the throng that'll come against you. But the more I think about it, Everyone that will take that position, every compromiser, really, they have a fight with the Lord, not with you. That's what it is. They're angry with God, trying to justify their conduct, their activity. Trying to justify it. Maybe to you. Or to people. Never. Never, 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 never. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. My, what an accusation. Go one step further now, what this Bible says. What does it say? And his word. What does it say? His word is not in us. That is very, very powerful. Did you hear the little word is? That's the verb to be, isn't it? That's what we call a present tense. It is the present tense of Amy, <coughs> the third person singular. That word, it says, does not perpetually continue to exist, have its residence in you. Do you know what this is implying? This is implying a fact of a knowledge to God, but not the word in the heart for the conduct. Because we're talking about conduct, isn't it right? We're talking about a standard for life. For life. Oh, well, listen. One of the most dangerous things in the world is to have a little of the Bible right there. Right there. But not here. <coughs> you folks, believe me now. You've got to believe me. Are in an extremely dangerous place. To be sitting in this class this morning, you're sitting in probably one of the most dangerous places that you could be in. Do you know why? Because you're hearing something about the Word of God. Now, if that Word does not become incarnate, part and parcel of your life, whereby conduct is ordered by the Word which has found resident in your life, then the knowledge of that Word is not sufficient Let me quote from you, for you from Matthew. <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have we not done many mighty miracles in thy name? 
Now listen. The Lord says, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Now there is a life's activity on the basis of knowledge. But that knowledge has not become a part and parcel of life. Life. If we say, come on in here. If we say that we have not sinned, first we make God the liar. And then secondly, His word does not continue to be part and parcel in us. The difference between one that stands for the Word and the one that compromises the Word is the fact that the Word of God is resident within a person and his heart's desire is to live the book. Be that kind of a believer, folks, so that you can have a clear conscience before God, knowing that in the walk, oh, it isn't that I got to, got to, got to do it. Isn't it a delight? And I'll tell you, for me to stand before Him, and hear that court say, you're guilty. And then hear my father say, I pardon you. You're totally forgiven. Nothing, get out there and live it. I have nothing for which to be proud of. But I have so much for which to praise him. I am guilty. But because of the blood of Christ, I'm a pardoned, guilty sinner. And I cannot say I have not sinned. Nor would I bring such a devastating accusation against God because you see what I'm doing I'm not blaspheming his name I'm not using his name in vain I'm degrading him lower I'm making him a companion to Satan's group, the liars. And then, taking a look at the Bible, the Bible's message, which I may preach, really isn't alive in my life. Eh? Isn't that weighty? I trust that here in this place that we can encourage one another by being steadfast and forthright in the Word of God whereby that the Bible will be alive in us and we'll take our rightful place before God not as proud, arrogant people, but as unmovable, steadfast, uncompromising, Bible-believing people because we want to love Him and walk thanking Him for what He's done. No, dear friend, you're not sinless in condition and you're not sinless in conduct. But if you'll confess your sins, he'll forgive it all.
And I'll tell you, it's wonderful to take that little one and all smelly out in the mud and everything else involved. And after that bath, hold that little one and enjoy the sweetness of that little one's presence that's clean, clean. And your father, I don't care what you do, dear brother and sister in Christ, slip and fall, we hope you won't, but if you do, confess it. He'll forgive you, and he'll cleanse you, and then walk with him. It's a wonderful provision he's made. Thank you, Father, for the brief moments that we have together. Saints them down tight. To our hearts. Let us walk with you and let us love you. It isn't that you won't let us. It's so often we don't want to because of what we do and where we go and what we say. Father, this is a wonderful group of folk here. They're yours, they're your property. And take your love letters truth from heaven's glory. And, oh, Father, by the Spirit of God, make it so real and so